Hello and welcome to the Logistics Business Virtual Show. I hope you're enjoying our exhibits and the rest of the facilities of the virtual show. Um, we have, as you know, a wide program of expert panels and this panel concerns software, which of course is an integral and essential part of any logistics uh, operation or process in today's world. And what we wanted to address was some of the buzzwords and the jargon that one constantly sees in logistics. Um, and maybe it might be helpful to have some of them defined a bit more clearly for us, because I know as a logistics media professional, I see these words all the time and I, I still don't know what some of them are. So it'll be helpful for me if for nobody else. Um, if you have questions for our panel of experts, please do use the text uh, facility, the live chat facility, which is on the uh, screen there and our experts will do their best to answer for you. Um, our panel is varied, it's global from all, all over the world. So what I'll do is I'll ask everyone to introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll start getting into some of these buzzwords. So Guido, let me start with you, if you introduce yourself. Yes, hi everyone. Hi, my name is Guido Recklesberg. I'm one of the co-founders of Setlock. We offer a supply chain management software here based in Germany and well, we're, we're a US German software company. So up to Fantastic. the Fantastic. Thank you, Guido. Tony? Hi there, my name's uh, <coughs> Tony Dobson. I'm CEO of Synergy Logistics. Uh, we supply a Snap Fulfilled WMS. Uh, we're based in the UK in Castle Donington and have uh, several offices in the US. Fantastic, and Diana? Hi, my name is Diana Geiger. I work for Sixfold and I'm uh, leading the customer operations department there. Um, yeah, we are part of the Transporan group and do real-time visibility. Fantastic, and Matthew? Hi, Paul, uh, Matthew Elanchikel. I am the founder and CEO of Forkites. We are a real-time supply chain visibility platform based out of Chicago. Excited to be here. Thank you. And last but not least, from Moscow, Vladimir. Hi, my name is Vladimir. I'm a senior vice president in First Line Software. We are a global uh, software engineering company headquartered in the United States. Okay, fantastic. So, as I said, our plan is not to discuss the big issues of the day, although we might get onto that, but simply to go through some of the buzzwords that exist in uh, logistics software today. So, let's start with I've got a list in front of me. Let's start with big data. Vladimir, why don't you start us off with that? What is big data? What does it mean? <laughs> yeah, that basically really is uh, probably top of uh, buzzwords in uh, software engineering as well because everybody is saying, okay, let's do a big data. What do what you mean? Uh, basically, yeah, when we're talking about uh, big data, it's quite broad story. Uh, the important thing, it's all about really a huge amount of data you are going to manage, understand, analyze, and so on and so forth. So uh, around this big data, we have, uh, you know, building of huge data lakes, which are combining called structured, unstructured data, a lot of stuff in terms of understanding of this data, classification of this data, and on top of that, analysis of this data and getting a value of this data. Very important is first, huge amount of data. Second, it's how to get value out of all this data. That's probably how I can briefly explain it. But there are a huge amount of different technologies around that and a lot of uh, even specializations. There are data scientists, data engineers, data managers, and so on and so forth. So a lot of people working around data. Kind of that. That was great. Does anybody want to expand on what Vladimir said? That's good. Everyone seems happy. I mean, machine learning is, sim is similar, isn't it? A similar sort of area. So let's, let's look at that as well. How, how about uh, Guido? Why don't you talk about that for us? Well, with machine learning, as you rightly said, you need a lot of data. And this is, you know, somewhere in our particular field that we that we find, um, I think we're not the best to approach because we take data out of the ERP system of our customers. But I look at, you know, for example, Matt and um, the lady from Sixfold, sorry, you know, the girl from Anna. Anna. <laughs> yeah. because You guys obviously take a lot of data, real-time tracking data. I think you're the, you're, the, you're the much better experts, you know, to really talk about and indulge in that. I feel. Diana, you, you, give, you tell us about that. Then. Yes. So actually, machine learning, I think, is really the, the key to automating processes, in our view. Um, and one very important thing that is sometimes forgotten about is um, that the quality of data is really decisive here. 
So you make you have to make sure that the quality of data is very good and you just not have only quantity, but also good quality. And how do you go and, about doing that? Well, you need, um, first of all, your setup and uh, how you get the data needs to be quite focused on um, yeah, the quality you want to achieve. So that's the entire technical setup that you're building. And then, um, of course, a lot of effort goes into cleansing the data, filtering it, uh, taking only what, what you know will produce good results. And nevertheless, I think machine learning, we are somehow a bit, some, especially in logistics, there's a bit of uh, respect for that, or maybe a bit of fear sometimes because there's all this big data flowing around and also there's a fear of data sharing sometimes because it might be to my disadvantage. But in fact, I think it's the, the, only, the only global way to analyze data. So whenever you, you work with experience or feelings, you, you might miss out the chance to look at certain areas that are in the dark. So machine learning looks at all your data and learns from it. And I think this is really, really what we need for prediction, for automation, and in the end, to grow a company. The only key issue here is that you need the good, the good quality data. Are we all agreed around the table that machine learning is very much here to stay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Probably I would, I would add that uh, important to understand that uh, uh, machine learning is uh, is not connected to a strict algorithm. So a lot of people are thinking that machine learning is similar to some strict algorithm, but in general, it's a black box. And learning here is a key word because it's a system which starts understanding. There is no strict algorithm inside. It starts really understanding some things and predict and so on and so forth. So that's very important. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Another word that we see everywhere in logistics, but. And people, you know, it might be, maybe it's clear what people think, but digital transformation or perhaps digital adoption. Tony, you have a go at that one for us. <laughs> digital transformation is becoming more and more important to us as companies like ourselves try to expand into, into the software world. I mean, basically it's, it's using the tools and, and facilities that you've got on your, or, on your software and basically the way we we look at it is it's an easy way for us to implement anywhere in the world so we really have got digital adoption and digital transformation uh, by basically throwing the tree away and throwing those pieces of paper away and trying to make sure that <laughs> everything is on is on your uh, device so that you can learn from that and we really are using some some really cracking products like uh, Walk Me and stuff like that and Teach Me that basically help people uh, in warehouses. If you've got, for an example, um, somebody who's just come in and doesn't know what to do, you know, we're, we're overlaying um, these products on top so that the guy can just pick a device up and go away and learn on the hoof. And, and we can also do that with our software on laptops and PCs. So. This digital transformation and digital learning is really, really coming up uh, uh, more and more in logistics, and and it's saving a fortune in training and and adoptions of time. Thank you. Anybody want to add anything to that? I I think especially in logistics, um, sometimes it feels like we're a little bit behind everybody else. So it's yeah. a very old school uh, industry. So. Yeah there's still a, a huge growth potential for digital transformation in logistics. And I think that by now, most companies have realized that it's not really the question if you want to play and if you want to go into this digital transformation process, but it's just a question when and how you will, you will manage it. Yeah, I, I think it's really important that you, you look at businesses in the past and logistics was always at the end and the back end and mm. everybody who wasn't that good ended up in logistics and, and the sexy end was all selling and the information there and, and order management and sort of warehousing and logistics is is you know sort of is the great is the great unknown and it's the great potential to improve businesses and efficiencies and we're now seeing with labor shortages just how crucial it is and, and where the savings can be 
And I think this digital transformation is enabling businesses to get more and more efficient in, in the logistics area. And the information that, that this is sprouting up is then going into these guys' products and, and being analysed. And I think that's where you'll get the real savings, putting those little percentage points off here and there. Okay, thank you, Tony. Uh, another big word. Can I add, because I think to me it's very important. Um, I think it has to do a lot with the change of mindset. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we talk about a lot of digital transformation and it's all super and, and, and uh, people tend to forget is, and it means like we have to do everything new. And this is, you know, uh, a reflex a lot of people have. I think the secret to really successful digital transformation is to preserve the old knowledge because that is there. And this is why so many people feel lost. Um, to take that on board and move that forward and say, you know, it's not a prediction in terms, you can say new technology in all expertise that is there. That's what we find a lot with our customers say here, you can digitize, but it's about collaboration. This is where it's preserving your knowledge and putting that into the future. And that is very important. And the logistics industry is something, you know, as you rightly say, they're, they're all a little bit behind. Uh, you know, uh, when it comes to that. And um, I think this is all our task as well. And Diana, you put it right, you know, it's there and um, we need to promote it. And this is part of our job as well. I, me, feel, I feel personally. So yeah, well, let me, let me speak to the rest of the panel about that. What are, the, what are the fears that you commonly find from customers about making this change? Because as you say, it requires a change of mindset. Yeah. What do you find they're frightened of? I mean, let's come to you, Matthew, on that. Yeah, you know, uh, it's interesting, all these buzzwords, even though, you know, we call them buzzwords, they are all interconnected, right? Yeah, sure. To do digital transformation, you, you know, machine learning plays a part, and for machine learning, you need big data, right? So this is all interconnected. And when I think about logistics and supply chain broadly, uh, the reason why, you know, we believe or we feel, you know, this industry has been behind the curve, if you will, it's because of the fragmentation, right? When you think about logistics, you know, in trucking, you have, I don't know, so many millions of trucking companies all over the world. Um, and when you think about technologies, it's again, very fragmented, right? You have transportation technologies, warehouse technologies, order management, yard management, inventory management, it's all siloed applications. And the fragmentation in technology and the fragmentation when it comes to technology uh, and fragmentation when it comes to providers, I think that is what is really, you know, really uh, contributed to uh, the, the, the lag, if you will, when compared to some other industries. And you add that to, you know, some of the ways by which we were operating supply chains, like just in time, uh, all those things, you know, are out, right? In the last 18 months, it's not just in time anymore. It is just in case. So, so the fragmentation, you know, different applications running in silos, and the new normal, if you will, uh, those are all the things that we see why, you know, why we are in this place. Okay, thank you, Vladimir. This, this question of customer fears, how would you address that? I know, I would probably say that a lot of companies really miss, uh, a lot of companies are thinking that, you know, if you are, you know, installing WMS in your warehouse, your starts to be digital. It's not true, completely not true, because it's just automation of your processes. So. Important in digital transformation is that uh, your company should start to be data driven, let's say it like that. Yeah. And uh, what Matthew said basically is this interoperability of the whole entire process inside of the company in logistic as well. Yeah. Interoperability of data in all of different systems and aspects working of your company will push you to become a digital company, yeah. And uh, that's very important. And, and still up until now, a lot of uh, customers really don't feel this uh, change. And therefore they think, that, okay, I will install CRM, I will install WMS. Now I'm digital, now everything will be good for me. Nothing will change. I mean, you just automate a part of your existing business. If your processes are good, maybe it will help you, but it, it's not to push you to be a digital. It's interesting, you know, what it reminds me of is when people wanted to be on cloud, they used to take the on-prem systems and host it on cloud and say, hey, we are in cloud, right? So that is, right, what, right. You know, yeah, so it reminds me of. Exactly, exactly. Sure. Anything to add on that, Tony, about customer fears? Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think there's a lot of fear in, in the whole supply chain at the moment. Um, I think... The new normal has been mentioned already in COVID 
and the way there is a rush to e-commerce and the way that B2B and the high street are suffering all around the world now. I mean, we, we in the UK are, and in Europe are very much leaders in the e-com field, particularly in the UK. And the amount of pressure we are getting from people to transform and, and the fears of, of, of the customer um, to, to online is, is incredible. I mean, the, the transformation we've done in some businesses is, is amazing. And I think this is the real, the real pressure in the new normal is, is, is people are going digital and people are going online. People are all working from home now. We've got a lot more time and they're, they're sat there waiting for their orders. I sit here looking out my window and I see a procession of white vans delivering people and that is that is our challenge in the supply chain is is how do we do that how do we get visibility and and how do we control that that absolute almost right turn that we've had in the last two years sure i mean you know this word new normal you, you've given us a start there telling what it means in logistics and the logistics industry. Any anybody else want to chip in on what the new what the new normal is within the logistics yeah. sector beyond what Tony said about visibility and uh, uh, you know remote working, e-commerce, etc. I mean, when we talk about, um, um, I think the complexity has the complexity of business models has increased tremendously. Mm. And, um, and that has started to increase, you know, a few years back. What and do you mean in terms of, sorry, Guido, do you mean in terms of companies going on the channel? Customers, for example, you got online, offline, you know, you got offline, then you got online, you got so many, okay, yeah, yeah. So much, you got so much new technology, you know, to our customers that are available out there. So the good old days of doing trade and, you know, doing business, this has become far more complex. Now we've got COVID. And, you know, all the supply chain disruptions and that's what we have, with, you know, um, with many of our customers, they go like, now they're really, they're daunted by all the problems, by all the complexities. Where do I start? And, you know, some have been laggards in terms of, you know, adopting technology. That's also been an issue. And um, I think this is where I say, you know, probably it's our part as well, you know, to see like, you know, where can we combine software offerings? How can we make it easier? Because it is a very, very complex situation. And the new normal means there's a lot of pressure out there. Sure. Okay. So we're hearing a lot of that consolidation there. Okay. So a key word is visibility, isn't it? That's not only a buzzword. It's something that's, you know, enshrined in modern logistics. Let's, let's hear what that actually means. Matthew, you, you tell us about visibility and maybe I'll come to a couple of others as well. Yeah, absolutely. So when we think about visibility, it is knowing exactly what is happening in your supply chain any given time. And also knowing the right amount of information, right? For the right parties at the right time, that is, that is very important. So that's the way we think about it. Now, you know, in, when we think about visibility, at least you know, in the industry publications, we tend to think of it as transportation visibility. Where's my truck? Where's my train, right? Where's a ship? Where's an airplane? Whatever it is. But you know, the message you know, we are conveying to the market is that doesn't mean anything, right? Just knowing where the truck is, it's useless. Or knowing where the train is, it's useless. Mm -hmm. It's all about knowing where the products are, whether it is sales order or purchase order, right? Or the SKU level data knowing where that product is, you know, in that end-to-end -end supply chain, that is super important. It might be in a truck, it might be sitting in the yard waiting to be unloaded. It might be sitting in a warehouse, it might be sitting in a store. You don't know, but having that product skew level visibility across the entire end-to-end -end supply chain beyond transportation, that is what visibility really means. And that's when you can really drive value. Uh, just, you know, tracking trucks on a map doesn't make any, doesn't mean anything. So. Right, thank you for that. Sarah, uh, Diana, sorry, I should say, give, us, give me, give me a, some expansion on that from your point of view, from Six Fold's point of view. Yes, so very much aligned with what Matthew said, and we have made the similar experiences with, with our customers that um, just a track on the map by itself does not provide any value. So what is visibility then? I think the key here is the, the predictive part as well. So not only what is happening now, but where will this SKU or this truck be in an hour? Will it be on time? Will it be late? Um, will it maybe arrive to a different place? 
And actually this knowledge is what we need to really optimize processes within companies. So to optimize logistics processes, supply chain processes. And that's actually where we see a huge potential for our customers. And every customer is different. So everyone has different areas, what they want to optimize. So some go in the direction of uh, warehouse optimization and others want to um, excel at customer service. So they want to really inform their customers very early and uh, provide them with every information they can. Um, others want to collaborate with suppliers, want to collaborate with several parties to have their processes aligned within a group of companies. So that, that is, there's a huge, huge value in that. And the basis of all of this is visibility. What is, what is going on now? Where is everything? And the, the 360 degree overview of that. Sure. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, moving on. Here's, here's, a, here's a phrase I need to have explained, and I'm going to come to you, Guido. API first. Well, I think we talked about it. It's like, you know, you have to, you have to push data back and forward. And we said, you know, Matt said it was so fragmented, the market. And this is what I mean. Like, you know, we have to tie up our offerings in order to give the best value to the customer. So what is the best value if, if you have in transparency is like, you know, make data move and make a data move in a way that is automated. So you have an automated process integration that is there. So and enable us on the one hand to say that, but that means then talking to customers saying like, if you want to have your very pink castle with a lake and a lot of trees around and some deer and all that, that is very beautiful. And we all feel very at home there, but nevertheless, that'll make it very difficult if you just have a wooden hut you know, to exchange data. You know, this is where I think it's an educational process for us. And I think all of us know and I see the smiles that then you got especially larger customers say like, yeah, but I have this very special process. I need to have it implemented. And we say like, no, that's very, yeah, Yes, we can do that and everyone of, of course we can do that but are you well advised to do it or is it better to keep more at the best practice uh, level at you know at a standardized workflow which will then enable you to tie in other systems so are you saying in those circumstances you they want to stick with an existing workflow and you're suggesting they should change it according to I you. think that's a huge change. I mean, I, I, I'm in this business, you know, for, for almost 20 years now doing, you know, SKU, you know, visibility. Yeah. And um, in global supply chains. And I think it's really changing. And we get more and more customers to say, like, I'd rather stick to a best practice workflow or I start off with that and I rather enjoy tying, tying in expect services, for example, like a four kites or a six fold that you guys offer. So like, you know, because you add a tremendous value if you do that. Yeah, and, and this is what I think, we see it in the B2C world. I mean, today, PayPal, everything is integrated and Aiden that you know as a payment service, you do it. Just define, yeah, B2C, business, you put, just define B2C, what you mean by that? Business, a lot of B2C are business to consumer, you know, models, business models. You have a lot of data exchange. So you have automated processes. You go like, for example, if you knew use HubSpot as a CRM system, I got so many other added value services that are being tied in via an API. It's super, it's brilliant. So I really, you know, thrive my job on, you know, additional data that I can get or services. In the B2B world, this is extremely difficult. Because all companies say like, well, we've got an ERP system that has a different configuration. I've got some specialities in there. And we're not saying get rid of all the specialities. Um, just rather define what is the value of the speciality in your business workflow, in your business process that you have until this day operated on. Do you really need it? Or do you like cut it off? And what do you get in return? Sure. Yeah, this Anybody is something for... Yeah, this is something, the API first, you know, we have some strong views on this. So first of all, you know, we hear it, hear about API first quite a bit, right, these days, but APIs have been around for a long time, right? For those of us in the, in the industry, you know, like all the systems, all, all the technologies out there, they had published APIs, but for some reason in the marketing, you know, lingo, it's coming up quite often these days. So that is number one. The second point is, you know, it's very important to really educate the market on whether, you know, API first is applicable across the industry, right? So when you think about trucking, for example, uh, the small trucking companies, they have no technology, 
right? They're still dispatching using a whiteboard or a post-it note, and you can write an API to a whiteboard, right? So I think, you know, making people understand that, okay, there are limitations to APIs, right? Both the parties have to have some technology to make it happen. Uh, just because I want API first doesn't mean all my vendors, you know, are API capable. Those are the things I think, you know, um, hopefully we can talk, the industry can talk more about it and uh, it doesn't become a burden, right? Uh, to a trucking company with one truck, if we go and tell them, hey, connect me via an API, they'll be out of business pretty soon. Sure. So that brings me on to sort of challenges. What, what's, let me go around the panel. What's the biggest challenge facing you at the moment in, in being successful in your business? Start with uh, Tony. Um, people at the moment. Um, I think the, the labour shortages and uh, the skill shortages, that, that is the biggest challenge stopping us growing our business at the moment. You, you'd want to say in a technology-based business like ours, that it'd be technology or there's something in the way. We've all got onto cloud, but really it's, it's that skill and knowledge of people. I think people are becoming very centric to everything we do. There's developer shortages all over the world and, you know, logistics business particularly is suffering from labor shortages of actual physical people to do stuff. But the providers like ourselves and I'm sure the other guys in the panel will say, it is people now that's causing the technology bottlenecks. Diana, let's come to you on that. Challenges in yeah, I I would say especially now also uh, facing this um, COVID and all the disruptions that come with it, there's a lot of insecurity around and uh, people being overwhelmed with the decisions they have to take and also reluctant to make uh, investments, so to say, so to really put resources on a digitization project. Um, on the one hand, they feel the pressure to do it. On the other hand, they feel other pressures as, as well. And um, they need a lot of guidance from us. So we really have to um, show them the benefits, the value of digitization of optimization of process automation that it makes sense to invest in that because it can deal with disruptions much better than what they're doing now. Um, and just this process is sometimes quite slow or slower than we would like to move. Sure. Say. Okay, Vladimir. I know uh, positive challenge I would say is that uh, at the moment, especially probably pushed by a new normal time, uh, demand is very huge. I mean, demand on IT services, demand on what we all, all the companies are providing. Yeah, because companies suddenly understood that they, they are sitting at home, their clients are sitting at home, they need somehow to communicate with them, they need somehow to provide services. They can do it only being digital and they start investing in digitalization. So, and for us, of course, it's a good story. Another story is that, yeah, keep in mind that we're all sitting remotely, we are, I would say, losing in all this, you know, people-to-people -people communication, which is very important in our business development. Even if you all are digital and talking about IT, yeah, a discussing of uh, quite complex uh, uh, questions, especially when we're talking about implementation of some, you know, uh, big change in, in the digital transformation of companies and supply chain. From time to time, it's important to sit in one room, you know, write something down on a whiteboard and so on and so forth. When we are all sitting in Zoom, it starts to be not so efficient. And it's a really quite a global issue at the moment, I would say it like that. So we are all facing it. Matthew? Yeah, I agree with, you know, all the points so far. If I may add one thing, it is the speed at which market is evolving. Uh, we haven't seen, you know, uh, this kind of, you know, the fast pace, right, in supply chain uh, yet. It's also an opportunity. If you can stay ahead of the curve, you, you can really, you know, really come out, right, uh, with some yeah. successful, you know, transformative products as well. But uh, the speed is something that, you know, that is a challenge and an opportunity uh, when we look at it. And Guido? Um, I think the biggest challenge is really, the, you know, the complexity of the situation that many of the people have to deal with that we talk to and also the lack of not being able to talk personally or just not at any time, you know, as uh, Vladimir said, you're missing something. 
it has a good side you know you can really do a lot of you know uh, uh, i think a, a lead generation or you know getting into contact with customers is a lot easier than it used to be and the good side is you don't have to travel you can have video calls and it's completely accepted and i think that's also on, on a broader scale extremely helpful yeah. but on the other end we still like it sometimes we miss it you know the same as we talked before you know are you still 100 percent home office or do you come back to the office i mean we're human beings we need to talk we need to talk face to face and you know to come to the best solution so it has you know an upside and a downside let's say i'm, I'm a customer looking to optimize uh, my processes. And I know that software and, and you guys are, are gonna play a major role in that. What would you advise me to do before I speak to you? What are the, what are the tips you would give me to, to make that process easier? Um, let's start with um, Matthew on that one. Absolutely. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, the software has to solve a business problem or a pain point. Mm -hmm. So having a clear vision as to what exactly are you trying to achieve from a business standpoint, that is very important. Second is, you know, is the organization ready for it? I think, you know, some of the panelists mentioned about change management, right? Where we have seen software fail is, uh, is you know, you implement everything, but then you can't get adoption internally. So is the organization ready for the change management? Uh, that is super important. And then, you know, the rest is, it's all, you know, plain vanilla stuff, right? Where, you know, you go through a vendor selection, uh, selecting the right vendor. But I think the cultural fit is super important between, you know, you and the software vendor. Because many times uh, in the SaaS world, it is not just one and done, right? You're really building a relationship with your software vendor because you have a lot of, uh, those things are very important. So I think that cultural fit is super important. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, do you have a clear vision on what you want to do? Uh, is the organization ready for, you know, ready for the change management and all the things that will come with it? And what is the cultural fit between you and the vendor? Those are three things that, you know, that I can think of. Powerful. Tony, anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the points made, I, I completely agree with. I mean, I was with a potential client yesterday, a massive uh, 3PL, and uh, we've been talking to them for two years. A year ago, I had a meeting with them. Two months ago, I had a meeting with them. Uh, yesterday, they actually admitted that their organization was ready for change now and before wasn't. And I think that's what these organizations have got to realize is we, we do this all the time. They don't. And they've got to be ready and understand what this change means and what their fears are. And a lot of companies now are analyzing that a lot more because the, the fear of failure is massive and people aren't making decisions in the past because of that. But I think people are being more courageous now and making decisions when they're not ready as organizations and they're not ready themselves. And it's refreshing to talk to an organization like that. And it's coming more and more common now where the fears are going away and the reality and the savings and the ROIs and the little percentage points I can make in efficiency are all really, really important in this very competitive world and this change world we find ourselves in. Yeah, Diana, that kind of echoed the point you made about sometimes you want to move faster than your kind of client is able to. I think Tony's a similar sort of issue that Tony's uh, referred mm -hmm. to there. What, um, what advice would you give to a customer who's in that position of looking to embark on making this change? In addition, if there's anything in addition to those very comprehensive suggestions that Matthew and Tony have said. Yes, maybe one point which is very similar to that. So, um, are they really committed to embark on this journey together? So they, they have to understand that it's not pushing a button or installing a software, like maybe 20 years ago, that was the case when they bought some new software. It's a, it's a whole change management process and they need to be willing to commit to that. That would be the main message, I think. And these customers have been very, very successful in implementing um, yeah, everything we can offer um, as opposed to the ones that are sort of yeah, still a bit reluctant to really invest and think that it will be done for them somehow. But it's, it's really very much self-motivated as well. Sure. Vladimir? I would say, you know, important here is, is if you are the customer, you shouldn't be afraid to fail. 
because it's it's very important and uh, you know a lot of clients are failing when they start you know doing all these load cycles like now i'm planning everything after that i will build everything then i will install it and only after that i will show it to to to, to the world and then they fail because nobody needs what they develop for example yeah and even in i don't know warehouse management system we're always pushing to show what will happen with warehouse to all warehouse people as soon as it's possible to show them i don't know mock-ups to show them some screens give them ability to touch it because you are integrating warehouse management system to be more efficient and it means that it should be very uh, useful for end users but not for you as a i don't know warehouse logistic director for example yeah and if you think that it's good it might be really bad for the entire team so it's important you know like a uh, like a build uh, try learn and make it in a cycle all the time and improve 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 don't be afraid to fail in some of these steps great and um, Guido have you got anything to add to this comprehensive well not really just to say like you know as Matt says you know the pain points and corona has really probably pushed the pain points or the point of pain beyond what is bearable and this is what we find and there's huge demand for what people say they tend to become less creative and rather say like, how would you do it? And this is, you know, this is, and mm. because, let's say like, you know, this is how others have done it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the right for you, but let me explain it to you why the other, other customers have done it that way. And I think that, that willingness to listen and um, that has really increased. And that is important. I think there's a willingness really to listen and say like, okay, I know I have my workflows and we're not judging whether they're right or wrong because they're there for a very good reason. And these are all successful companies, but I say like, okay, there's, there's a point beyond. Yeah. You need to improve because you see other business model all of a sudden improving. And that, that mindset of change, I think that's what we're seeing a lot with customers. And I think yeah. that's very important and that's very good. I think we're seeing, I think I personally believe we're going to very productive um, um, uh, time. When it comes to that, with many companies that are really willing to change and, you know, change successful ways of doing business, but let's say elevating them to the next level. Sure. Yeah, I was taught a very good line by, by a sports coach once who said, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. And I think that's very appropriate in this kind of stuff that you're talking about, you know. Um, listen, this is another big word, and this isn't a buzzword. This is an important word. It's going to affect every company. Um sustainability um we we know that there are government set net zero targets we know that this stuff matters and it's important so what role can supply chain software play in this what does sustainability basically mean in in, in this sector i'd love to get all of your views on that and how relevant you think it is so um maybe start with you diana yeah we we have seen that it has huge impact at the moment so a lot of customers both shippers carriers lsps all participants are very interested in sustainability topics and i think software uh, especially visibility software because i know this one very well um, it can really help you first of all to understand where you are so that's something that most companies already are missing. So what is my baseline? Uh, and then to understand how can I become more sustainable and how can I cut emissions, especially in, in logistics. And there are a lot of, um, well, there's a lot of potential in uh, increasing the, um, let's say capacity and reducing empty mileage on a, on a global level for a platform like ours, which has, a, or also for Kites, which combines a lot of players into a large network, there you can really have uh, cumulative effects mm -hmm. and you can actually save a lot of CO2 just by suggesting the right combinations of um, lanes, carriers, shippers. So I think there's huge potential there. And now we also see the willingness of the customers to, to invest in that. Probably because they have to, yeah, yeah. yeah. Vladimir. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. indeed. <laughs> yeah. Vladimir, what do you think? Yeah, you know, basically, uh, yeah, uh, kind of uh, all buzzwords we already today said, it's a part of, you know, a uh, path to sustainability as well, yeah, because mm -hmm. if you are data-driven, if you are digital, if you are optimized, if you are 
uh, agile in some way. Yeah, if you are focusing on all of this stuff, yeah, sustainability will come to you anyway because yeah, you will be more efficient in this part. So I would say that definitely, yeah, what we are all are doing in digital transformation and supply chain specifically, yeah, it's just one of elements of all this ecosystem and sustainability. Okay, Gida. Well, let's put it that way. I think, you know, there are three levels of sustainability that you have. We have the social sustainability, you have the ecological sustainability, and you got the economic, the financial sustainability of companies as well. And you think you have you have the three of them. And, you know, this is what we often are offering with our supply chain software. That's very important to us to bring that along. If you have collaboration, if you connect, if you create transparency, if you share workflows, if you integrate then you manage to get slack out of the supply chain. Slack in terms of mm. ecological waste that you do not need. Yeah, if you can avoid an air freight from Asia and put that on a, on, on a sea level, you'd get very different, um, uh, a very uh, different uh, CO2 footprint, just because maybe very early on in the process, something went wrong. So if you make that transparent, you really have a positive impact. The same is the social impact. If you, and that is, um, if you if you integrate in our platform, you know suppliers and the customers can collaborate. You integrate your workflows. You share best practices. That will have a positive impact impact on the relationship that you have. And what we currently see is a lack of trust. There's a lot of insecurity in global supply chains. This is what we see. And you know it all adds up. Has a very positive effect to the financial economic sustainability because this is what we're all in as well. Sometimes people tend to forget and a lot of customers says, hey, I, I am under a lot of pressure, but you know, doing things like that, it will have a positive impact on your bottom line as well. And that's very important to get the CFO who has to spend money or anything yeah, in the boat of the CEO. And, but this is what people more and more you know, um, you know, start to understand. Thank you, Guido. Tony? Um, it's not as relevant to me as the other guys. I think they're making a bigger difference with the, the, the visions and the pictures that they yeah. see. But in, 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 the, in the warehouse sense, we've, we've just done a, an application for a government grant. And that, that was all about actually saving people traveling to warehouses was one of our big things and becoming more efficient use yeah. of space in there so that things don't need to, to move as fast and as often or build as many warehouses. And that's, that's what we're looking at is becoming extremely efficient. I mean, most, most warehouses are full of space. Um, they're not full of product and they're not full of people. So it's all about how we get um, you know, automation in there. We've, we've talked about mm -hmm. in, 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 a, in our industry and, and how we can save people walking 14 miles a day in an Amazon warehouse. You know, how do we stop them doing that? How do we get more efficient and therefore need less people? Because that, that sustainability to me is, is, is all we can do in the warehouse is, is just pack it more efficiently and, and get less people working there more efficiently. And that's that's. No, thank you. It's a great answer. And finish with Matthew on that one. Yep. So a lot of great points. Um, you know, when you think about sustainability uh, or greenhouse, you know, gas emissions, I would say logistics, right? It's one of the primary contributors, especially, you know, in the trucking world. Yeah. So there's a lot of, lot of focus on sustainability from, you know, from, you know, that we are hearing and seeing from the industry. So I think, you know, at a, at a high level, um, you know, a couple of things that can really help companies understand, right? If if they can contribute to a sustainable world, number one is, uh, you know, are they selecting the right mode of transportation, right? Truck versus train, because intermodal or train, it is, you know, it is it is uh, more uh, a sustainable way of transportation. Uh, are they, you know, uh, going take the right route, right? Is it a longer distance or is it an optimal distance, right? Uh, that will take you from point A to point B. Uh, third one could be, you know, are they running empty, right? Are they running their trailers empty to pick up, you know, products? So I think these are all the, you know, very minor things that can really have a significant impact uh, on enhancing sustainability or achieving the sustainability goals. So providing tools like, you know, what's the average distance, right? How much, you know, time are you running empty? Uh, what is the estimated emissions by mode, by lane? These are all the things that people are people are starting to care about. Companies are starting to care about, mm -hmm. and I heard about the slack in supply chain 
uh, that is something you know that is that is getting amplified these days uh, mm. because of the shift in the demand patterns right you might be um, you know always shipping from a dc to the store but now uh, store volume you know sales has gone down and it's more online so now you have to immediately shift right from a different dc um, so all those things are disrupting the transportation networks which means right you're not taking the most efficient route you're running empty Mm-hmm. And all this disruption that we have seen and that we are seeing, continue to see, it is all really impacting, right, emissions and sustainability. So people are all dying to figure out what is the baseline, how has it changed, what can we do uh, to make it better. So huge topic, big topic for us. Thank you. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm certainly a bit buzzworded out, though I have to say, I think it's teased out some incredible insights into how customers might think uh, and the, the, you know, the incredible differences that, that your businesses and your solutions can make for them. So let's finish by giving all of you the opportunity to, to illustrate what you do, maybe to talk about a, a customer use case or, or just simply about what you do, but um, maybe just an illustration that shows our, shows our viewers the sort of differences you can make uh, with your products. So um, I don't know who might be ready to go first. Has anyone got anything they want to talk about straight away? Or shall I select somebody and put them on the spot? <laughs> Edo. Come on, I was about to say, you've enjoyed that so much to put us on the spot. So there yeah. you go. <laughs> <laughs> so who wants to start? You Watch start, out. Edo. You start, Edo. Oh. Exactly. The first one moves losers. It's like in poker. No, there you go. Well, <laughs> I actually, you know, I actually appreciate it, and I, 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 I really love what we're doing. So we we'll basically... we'll give you the last word then. So you do your, then I'll give you the last word at the end. All right. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, no, what we basically do is, you know, I, you know, our customers are. We have a lot of retailers, brands that have, you know, gl- global uh, sourcing requirements that have global supply chains that source that source a lot from the Far East. So what we basically do is, it's a cloud-based um, cloud-based technology and um, we basically take the PO and we uh, replicate any kind of touch point of a PO in a global supply chain by having said that so we take the PO and then we connect forwarders suppliers factories testing labs they're all basically connected in the portal in the customer portal so if you for example think of our customer Salando in Germany in Berlin so any kind of you know um, um, you know uh, you know style and product they source, uh, they uh, they track with our software, but they don't only track it, but they collaborate with their supply chain partners. We have a management by access to a management by exception principle, so they can actually see who need, who needs to do what particular job, what per, uh, certain point in time, and that's very important. So to really you know enhance collaboration, exchange information, and this is what we feel is is a different level of transparency that you get because you really integrate with your supply chain partners yeah, and put the ideal workflow in there and then said, okay, if the goods have to be, you know, at the customer or in the warehouse, you know, what are particular steps that need to be done and who needs to do them and what um, 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 certain point in time. And that drives great value. And having said that, as we now have then all the suppliers, you know, in the, um, um, you know, in the portal, then, you know, we learned from our U.S. customers to say, like, well, can we do some social compliance issues? And we said, yes. So why don't we replicate this, the cascade of the supply chain? So who are the factories? You know, where are some other materials that have been used for production? Where are they being produced? Are, show, are social standards being, um, being uh, complied with? And um, so it's a very comprehensive suite. Um, in terms of, you know, supply chain management that we offer there. And um, we ourselves have gone through, you know, a digital transformation ourselves. But that's why I know a lot about it and, you know, know all the pains. And a lot of customers, you know, give us kudos for that is in order to really have this. That's why I say API to have like a very, you know, standardized, we call it a best practice offering that we can say. Yeah, because that really drives value. It's easier for everyone around the world to understand and to comply with your workflow. To, to basically get the best job done. Yeah. Well, I understand that a lot better from having, I understand that a lot better, Guido, from you talking about it today. So thank you for that. Um, Vladimir, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. So uh, basically, yeah, my company, First Line Software, we are from one side, we are a software engineering company. So we develop a lot of different software solutions for our clients worldwide. And 
it's not only in the supply chain, it's also in, for example, in, for retails, what is important at the moment is digital marketing, all this kind of, you know, omni-channel stuff, uh, a customer journey, m management, and so on and so forth. But talking about supply chain, of course, yeah, one of the key topics for us is uh, warehouse logistics. And here uh, we are partnering with a German-based company, Viastar Software, uh, and we are facing with new normal some new challenges as, because, for example, yeah, I want just to share with you our probably one of the newest projects we, we just finished uh, was also about, you know, implementation of WMS. And it started in a normal time, but it's, it's ended in new normal time. And what was the challenge, basically, when we are doing a integration of WMS, when we are finalizing the project, we are always spending a couple of weeks on site. Yeah, supporting the uh, warehouse people, supporting IT department, doing all this integration management, so on and so forth. But due to pandemic time, we had no chance to visit them. We had to stay at home and somehow to finalize the project because clients uh, need it. Yeah, they need to start their new warehouse. They need to move forward. And basically, we did a lot of changes inside of our processes. So we changed a lot of training procedures. We changed a lot of our communication plan with them. We did a lot of, uh, you know, like kind of video reviews of the warehouse, how it works. Uh, in fact, yeah, to be able just to realize what's happening inside there without visiting it. So a lot of things changed for us as well. So, uh, and for us, it's important to keep agile, but I, because I suppose that a lot of new change will come in the nearest future because this new normal time will keep on pushing us, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> new challenges and new features and we need to be prepared and good for companies uh, and uh, our clients and clients of colleagues who are already digital or on the way to be digital because for them all these challenges will be i would say uh easier to manage rather than to companies who stayed in the old old sure. time thank thanks vladimir okay matthew yeah so we are a real-time supply chain visibility platform uh we are global multi-model uh beyond transportation right in the yard we are housing and everything else and the real goal, you know, for Kites is to really provide insights into where things are at any given time and also provide recommendations as to what they should be doing to really deal with an impending disaster if that's going to happen, right? So really providing that prescriptive recommendation based on real-time visibility, that's what we do. And it includes a lot of, you know, data collection, right? Big data, machine learning, all those buzzwords, we, you know, that's all behind the scenes. But at the end of the day, you have to simplify it for your clients to solve business problems. So take all this data and build applications using the data to really solve very specific business problems, whether it is how to manage the labor at a store, right? Based on the incoming truck arrival or how to you know, uh, dynamically uh, slot, do the slot booking based on the truck arrival, how to do the sequencing of picking and packing and staging inside the warehouse based on the ETA. So it's all about building applications using this real-time visibility. Uh, that's what we do for global clients. Thank you very much, Diana. Yes, so uh, six foot and transparent platform. Um, we are the real-time visibility provider. So technically very, very similar to what Matthew already said. Um, the, the goal I think for, for the customers of the transparent group is to support them in two key areas. One is optimize all the logistics processes with our um, software offerings. And the second one is to optimize their matchmaking processes. So actually to make suggestions, who should work together with whom, in which way to really get the optimal outcome, most sustainable outcome. And um, maybe I have one, one of my favorite stories um, of, um, of a customer. It's from March 2020, so first COVID wave hitting Europe. And um, there it is a very nice example of a customer journey. So we very much focus on going, um, embarking with our customers on this journey and sort of leading them, um, showing them how to use real-time visibility and they were reaching out to us saying um, hey guys we have a huge problem um, it was actually it was a big um, FMCG producer very important in March 29, uh, 2020 
guys, we want to reroute our trucks, but some, um, some borders are closed now. Italy is half closed. Some in France are closed. We don't know how to reroute them because we don't know what is open, what is closed, where, where do they get stuck? And um, yeah, then we actually work together with this customer to build a real-time map consolidating all the data that we have in an anonymized way. And what came out of that was a, um, a map, a border map that we actually made avail available online free of charge for everyone who wanted to use it. And that, that was a, a great example of, yeah, how we sort of in an agile way interacted with a customer and then got an outcome that, that really made a difference for these, for these weeks. Great story, thank you. And Tony? Hi there. Um, yes, we've had um, a, a very busy year uh, because of the, the turnaround with COVID and everything else. And, talking about buzzwords is digital transformation. We, we started uh, planning, we do WMS systems, so everything inside um, the box of the warehouse, and uh, we just go for ultimate efficiency. And one of the things we were finding is that, um, particularly 3PLs um, were, and larger organizations were struggling to roll out to multiple sites. So we've actually used digital transformation products to enable that to happen. So we've now got four examples of large organizations actually rolling out our software without our help to brand new sites. So we really see the world changing and we've managed to affect a change um, because of the configurability of our software. That means that the guys on the ground can actually configure the software for any location, any warehouse, any, any patterns, any picking patterns, any order patterns, any rule patterns and they can do that simply. So we've now got guys in the US rolling out remotely, and this has forced us to do this as well because of COVID and we can't travel. So we've actually grown um, significantly because of our ability to remote implement. And then our clients have taken our remote implementation techniques and started to use that themselves to roll, remotely roll out their own um, warehouse network. I mean, we've got one guy who's just rolled out five. We had a guy yesterday who rolled out to three sites with two massive global brands uh, on his own um, without any interaction with us whatsoever. So we, we really see this new world and this new normal as, as given a lot of advantages that we didn't see 18 months ago. Yeah. Necessity is the mother of invention, to quote another. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, Guido, I promised you the last word. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I fear that. No, I think I really enjoyed it, first of all. And um, I hope um, uh, the audience uh, feels likewise. Um, I, I think what we really felt is, um, yeah, it, technology can help. So there's, is it, it is an extreme situation. And um, I, for me, the glass is always ha half full and not half empty. And I know it's a really, for many companies, a really tough situation out there, but you know, we can always make the best out of it. And uh, I think we're all here willing to do that, to play our part and, and talk, you know, exchange information, exchange best, best practice, you know, and help each other. You know, there's always something good coming out of a really bad crisis. Absolutely. Well, software, I think, can be quite a dry subject, but it's so important that you guys have really brought it to life today. Um, if you have... Any questions, as I say, please do use, use the live text facility, the chat facility, and we'll endeavor to, for our panelists to answer those questions for you. But meanwhile, very enjoyable. Thanks to Diana, to Matthew, to Vladimir, to Guido, and to Tony. And I hope I'll see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.